As the Olympic Games came to a close in Beijing, Jim McKay's once popular sporting phrase, the thrill of victory, faded into the second part of that quote, to the agony of defeat. The world watched in horror as Russia invaded Ukraine just days after the closing ceremonies. Talks between the two nations are taking place in Belarus, helping us all at least to breathe a small sigh of relief. All this week on The Perspective, the grit, determination and faith of elite athletes. But first, direct from Ukraine, Pastor Pavlov Luzinski speaks with Mike and Julie from his church in Lviv, Ukraine, about the steadfast faith of the people there. Pavlo decrying over email, there is so much destruction, it's absolutely nuts. And continuing with the athletes, conversations with hockey great Paul Henderson, sensational softball slugger Jennifer Gilbert, prized fighter Mandy Bougeau and her coach, pro boxer Sid Vanderpool, the golden voice of the Toronto Raptors, Herbie Kuhn, all champions in their own right and all part of the unique organization Athletes in Action as we pray for the innocent people of Ukraine and Russia. You know, as we think about what is happening in the world today, one of the things we find is that sports becomes a great distraction um, mm -hmm. for good and for bad. And sometimes it can be unhealthy, but many times very positive. And right now, it's almost like we need a distraction. But Julie, tell us a little bit about yourself. What are some of the things that you like to do when it comes to the sporting world? Well, you know, it's interesting because I find that sports really helps me physically, mentally, and uh, emotionally. I find when I fence, it actually helps me to get rid of all the stress and all of the things that overwhelm me. And I can really focus and be strategic. And, and when I paddleboard, I find that that is something that where I just feel like I'm able to just paddle and talk to God and just let the stress just ooze out of me physically and emotionally. So I think that sports many, many times help to bring us into focus into what is important in our lives as well as helping our bodies. Well, and as you talk about that, we have Jennifer Gilbert with us today, and we're going to talk about her sporting career. But we do that against the backdrop of what is happening in the world. And as you're aware, the Paralympics have excluded Russia and Belarus, wondering what the athletes are feeling on both sides about those decisions. But also as the world watches on and as we watch sports, sometimes it keeps us from uh, the reality of what is happening on the bigger screen. But our hearts today go out to the people of Ukraine. And as we continue to pray for them, I hope you'll support them. We're going to be sharing how you can do that across the screen throughout the program today. But we're going to be right back with baseball slugger uh, Jen Gilbert. Well, I'm delighted today that Jennifer Gilbert is with us. She hails originally from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. How cool is that? Well, it is a cool place, and pun intended. But she has spent a lot of her time in Texas. But we know her in Canada because she has helped Team Canada in so many ways. As a, a baseball player, she helped Team Canada at the Worlds in 214 and 218, taking home bronze. The list of accomplishments are huge and impressive. One time a 429 batting average. And then, of course, uh, in the 2020 Olympics, helping Canada qualify for that was just huge. And I want to welcome Jennifer today. So glad to have you on The Perspective. Glad you're with us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we've got a mutual friend, Bob Johnson, from Athletes in Action, who helped put this whole week together. And Jen, you've been playing baseball most of your life. And all your hard work granted you the opportunity to compete in the Olympics, even win a bronze medal. Tell our viewers a little more about yourself and what led to that incredible, incredible journey. Yeah, so I started playing softball when I was about four. Um, then I started playing competitive softball when I was about eight. Uh, I went to the College World Series for the first time. Um, they played in Oklahoma City, which is about three hours from my home where I grew up. And I just remember walking into the stadium and the crowd was electric. Um, the game was just so fast paced. And just really that moment, God put it on my heart that I wanted to play softball at a really high level. Uh, I wanted to play at university. I wanted to 
potentially represent Canada, uh, where I was born, the country that uh, where I was born in the Olympics. And uh, yeah, it was just a dream since I was eight. Uh, so finally, 21 years later, I finally got that dream to, to come true. Uh, softball was put back into the Tokyo Olympics. And um, yeah, it was just such a dream come true. Well, you know, as you think about the dream, let me just ask this, how do you sustain the dream? How did you keep it? Because in the midst of it, there was incredible accomplishments. Like I'm reading your stats and I'm thinking, okay, I was envious, no, no doubt about it, okay. <laughs> but how did you keep the dream alive? Talk to me about that. You know, I think it was really uh, the talent that God has given me um, and also the, the hard work. My, my mom has been such a huge impact on my life and just watching her. She owns her own business. She was the primary uh, financial provider for, for our family when I was growing up. And I just grew up watching her work till like one, two in the morning, wow. growing her business, working so, so hard. And so I grew up with that kind of role model and she just really instilled in me if you want something, you have to work for it and you have to work like your competition doesn't sleep. And so I think with the talent that God gave me um, combined with my work ethic um, and certainly there were opportunities that came and um, I was fortunate to take advantage of those. And it was really uh, and during the Olympics, I could just see how God's hand was in um, the whole thing. Talk to us about the Olympics for just a little bit. What did it feel like? What is it actually like to get there and to be a part of it? Yeah, it certainly after uh, it being delayed for a year due to the pandemic, it was kind of like, oh, we finally got here. And it was just so cool to see uh, Tokyo and the city and just all the different countries and cultures represented, all the different sports. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to go to the other venues due to restrictions um, due to health and the pandemic, but we got to watch a few of them on TV when we weren't playing. Um, but yeah, it was just so cool to see the world and to see everybody come together um, out of the pandemic and um, able to make the Olympics work. Well, as you talk about that, we can jump ahead a little bit in the story because after the Olympics, you retired. Now, okay, I'm gonna have a little bit of fun with this. You just seem way too young to retire. Uh, but talk to me about the highs and lows. Was that a difficult decision to make? How did you know, you know, this is the end? How did you do that? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was for sure bittersweet. Um, I've done this for so long. It's every single day I was doing some kind of training, whether it be softball related, weights or um, conditioning. So it was very much a part of my life, but I think I was just ready for that next chapter. I wanted to see what um, God had in store for me after softball, um, who Jen Gilbert is without softball. I wanted to experience that and um, hopefully settle down, have a family someday. So uh, I was emotionally ready to be done. Um, body was kind of ready to be done as well. So it just kind of all came together. And what better way to end your career than winning a bronze medal at the Olympics? I mean, that, that's incredible in itself. Um, but earlier this week, we had Herbie Kuhn on the program. And, and Herbie Kuhn is the announcer for the Raptors. He works with professional athletes. He said something that's been ringing in my mind, and I want to bring it to this conversation. He talked about athletes and finding their identity. You know, especially if they come up through the ranks, maybe they accomplished what they were hoping to, or maybe they didn't. And yet they had to re, they have to find themselves there has to be more than just hitting a baseball or you know, a slam dunk. What are your thoughts on identity and, and how has that shaped your thoughts in the last two years? Yeah, I absolutely agree that your identity has to be in Christ. And for a really long time, mine wasn't. It was wrapped up in my softball performance. Uh, if you ask me what the most important thing to me was, it was how I was performing on the field. And it wasn't really until my second year of playing pro, so it was in uh, 2015. Uh, I had really not been in my faith for a really long time, probably around 10 years. Um, I didn't really pray. I didn't really read my Bible. And it was because my identity was in something that was um, not eternal. And finally, God had just given me enough rope. And he was like, okay, you're you're coming back to me. You're, you're making an idol of the gift that I gave you. And you're not going to do it anymore. And 
So I, thankfully, uh, by his providence, I was rooming with two of my teammates who were Christian women. And um, it was just really convicting of me to see them, you know, go to Bible study and read the word and be so obedient to Christ and just submitting everything to him. And so I said, okay, we're going to get back. We're going to get back to worship and fellowship and reading scripture and so God just really did a, a 180 on my heart, but um, I'm so glad that he did. And I just kind of felt all the fear and anxiety go away. My wow. identity was no longer wrapped up in um, the sport that I played. It was wrapped up in um, someone eternal. So I was very grateful for, for that struggle well, that I went through. Well, you know, Jen, as fantastic as it was to win a bronze medal for our country, what you have just shared is simply inspiring to me and I believe to our viewers. And we're going to come back and ask you some more questions. Julie's got some questions. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. I told my mom when I was eight years old, like, Mom, I'm going to be a great softball player someday. And I want to play for Canada in the Olympics when I grow up. And she just kind of stared at me. She was kind of taken back that an eight-year-old could say something so profound. but. Um, she said, like, honey, that's great, but it's going to be a lot of hard work. And I said, like, I know, but I want to do it. I think just growing as a person, um, dealing with different coaches, different teammates, um, having, like, those small sacrifices with, like, your social life, you know, going to school and not being able to go out with friends to the movies because, you know, you were playing a tournament the next day. Um, yeah, I think uh, just, I guess, trying to always make sure that you're getting better year after year and challenging yourself because you know that at the end of the road, you know, it's going to take a lot of hard work to make like a national team. No, Jen, it isn't just anybody who can dedicate their life to a love of a sport, and especially without help. And you've mentioned about your mom. Tell us how your family uh, reacted to your desire to play softball. You've mentioned about the sacrifice your mom has made. How have they truly supported you over the years? Yeah, it's certainly easier for them because I'm an only child. <laughs> but, okay. um, but yeah, I think it was really a family affair for us, uh, just a way for us to spend more time together. And a result of that, I'm very close with uh, both my parents, but we go out to the ball field every other day. My One of my parents would feed the pitching machine and the other one would shag balls in the outfield as I would hit. And um, one of them, I used to be a pitcher. One of them would catch for me. Um, somebody else would hit ground balls to me. Um, so yeah, it was really just a family affair. And they knew that it was really important to me. Um, my mom comments all the time that she could just really see that I was very passionate about softball. And um, so she could feel my passion. And I think that kind of led her to be passion, passionate to get me the best coaches, the best teaching, um, get on a really good travel ball team. That was just really cool because you know some parents might say listen it's it's baseball what do you what's softball what do you what are you doing you know how, how are you going to survive here you know are you going to make any money what, what's more important but it's fantastic that they actually said listen we see the passion we see that you have something special here and we'll do everything to help you you know like i want to ask you this it's probably your parents but it might be somebody else who would you consider to be an important role model in your life yeah, aside from my mom, I would say she's number one, but mm -hmm. another role model would be Jenny Finch. Um, I just really identified with her when I was younger. Uh, we had the same name. We mm -hmm. both had blonde hair. Um, and she was also, she's also to this day a very strong Christian woman. And um, just growing up, watching how she represented Christ on the field, off the field. Um, it just really showed me that you can be a strong believer and a really tough competitor. Well, you know, you yourself are also a role model. And I was just wondering, have you had anybody sh actually share how they've been encouraged or any personal stories that any just one you could share with us at least? Yeah, I've had a few, um, many kids that I've teached or um, kids that have watched me and then they'll message me on social media. Um, and it's really encouraging. They, they say first that I inspire them to be more like Christ, um, which is always my goal. Um, I always want to try and inspire young girls to pursue softball at a really high level. But um, really, I really hope more that I'm inspiring them to be more like Christ. 
Um, but yeah, it can be anything as, as far as like my energy that was on the field, um, how I conducted myself off the field. Um, kids would come up and ask us for autographs after the game. And I try to like, you know, ask their names and, you know, ask where they're from, just get a little bit personal detail, just to kind of get to know them as people um, rather than just signing their ball and handing it back to them. But um, yeah, I think I just try to influence uh, for the kingdom um, when I was out there on the field. You know, how, how do you feel that your faith has played a role in your career as a personal, uh, as a professional athlete? You said you had a rough patch there up in 2015. How did you feel it really made a difference after that? Yeah, I think uh, it was a, a little bit of a double-edged sword um, being so hard on myself and uh, uh, just really, I had a so you're fear. You're a perfectionist. Of, yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Fear of failure, um, fear of not maybe playing for Team Canada in the Olympics, uh, not being good enough, um, just not performing. And I think just what Christ has done for us that we can never uh, perform perfectly, right? It's all by grace through faith. And it definitely, when I finally understood how my identity is in Christ and I made my identity in Christ and not in softball. It kind of took away that fear of failing. And I just really learned to trust my talent and the hard work. And I trusted that if there was anything else that I needed to improve on um, or, you know, change my thought process, God was going to show me what I needed to do to get better um, and I just really learned how to trust on him versus solely trusting on myself and trying to do everything on my own. And I think that's a good point, because you, when we find our identity in Christ, it really does relieve the pressure. We have all this it pressure does. of like we, we have to do this in our own strength and, our, and otherwise we're failures. But when we even like, OK, our identity's in Christ and, and I want people to understand it doesn't mean we're giving up. It means, no, we, our identity's in Christ. Now we're going to do our best out of joy and love because we've been given this talent. I think that's fantastic. Listen, I want to ask you about athletes in action and your involvement with them. How long you been with them and, and, and what does that in, involve? Yeah, so I met uh, Bob Johnson through Instagram. Um, he had reached out to me after the Olympics. He actually watched um, our game against the U.S. And he reached out on Instagram um, when I had returned to the States. Uh, and he just said, I would love to meet with you. I'd love for you to join our uh, Zoom Bible study group with other coaches that he has. And um, actually, one of them was one of my role models growing up, Leah Amico. Uh, she's a three-time Olympic gold medalist for Team USA for softball and uh, just was so cool to meet her on Zoom and we're still friends to this day and yeah we meet once a week and um, then Bob and I also host uh, uh, Athletes in Action for Team Canada Athletes on Friday mornings um, so yeah we just study the word we pray for each other uh, I'm just really grateful for the community that AIA has um, for Team Canada and just hoping that I can continue to be a part of it. Well, Jen, thank you so much for being a voice to people in your community and in sports and, and for women, for young women. Thank you for being a shining light and for all your accomplishments. It's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much. These women inspire me so much. Um, I've never played on a team I've never played on a team with this many influential people and they all influence in such different ways and it's made me such a better human being. Um, aside from the softball piece, um, I'm just incredibly grateful for this atmosphere, um, the growth that I've made being a part um, of this program for the last 10, 11 years. I just learned so much from each and every one of them. Um, we've all been through such different phases of our lives and um, the fact that I can go to anybody on this team with a struggle or um, if I need advice, um, we're all at that level where we're very comfortable going to each other. You know, as we pondering things during this week where we focused on sports and athletes, 
One of the things that keeps coming up is who has been their mentor? Who has been their model? And athletes look for people that they can model themselves after, but you and I do it as well. We're always watching whether we want to admit it or not, who we're going to imitate. I remember reading about a dad who was walking in a snowstorm and his five-year-old son behind him yells out and says, hey dad, look at me, I am walking in your footsteps. And as we think about that analogy of walking in someone's footsteps, of watching how they unpack life and how they do life, we come back to the book of Colossians. And here in the book of Colossians, Paul is talking about the church and what were the, the markers of the genuineness of their faith. And he talked about their faith in Christ. He talked about their love for people, which was just astounding. And he talked about their hope. And as he talked about those three things, it comes back to uh, who it was they were modeling. And they'd seen this in leaders in the church. They'd seen it in Paul himself and in other people. But you know, what we see in verse 7 of Colossians 1, let me read it to you. He said, just as you have learned it. What did they learn? They learned how to do life, how to follow after Christ. He said, after you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved servant. Now, I don't know if you have children, but I would not call them Epaphras. But you know, on the other hand, Epaphras stands out like a glowing light. Uh, we were talking to Jen Gilbert today, and as we're talking to her, or the other day it was Herbie Kuhn or Paul Henderson and different people this past week, we've seen how as Jesus got a hold of their life and they surrendered to him, they've become like a bright light. They've become like a mentor. But what stands out now, it says that, the early church looked at Epaphras. He's a beloved fellow servant. And I love that phrase, our dear fellow servant. Not someone who is above them because he was one of the leaders. No, he says, I'm a fellow servant and I'm a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. If we were to jump over to one of Paul's other books in Philippians chapter 2, verse 29, he actually says, honor men like him because he talks about Epaphras. He almost died for the work of Christ. He gave his life for the work of Christ. Earlier this week, we were interviewing uh, Pastor Paul in Ukraine. And I know that Paul and his family, they're contemplating what's involved in staying and ministering to people. And he's gone there because he's willing to lay down his life. I honor people like him. Or Pastor Nick, and there's many others who are following the example, not of a baseball player, not of a hockey player, but of people like Epaphras. And they're saying, you know what? They have been willing to lay down their life. That's who we are going to follow after. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture as we think about the models that we follow. But there's something else here that we find in verse 8. I want to read it to you. And it talks about Epaphras. Says, he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. You see, what transforms us is the way that we do life in the power of the Spirit. And you and I can't have the, the in, internal fortitude to lay down our lives uh, or to do something, you know, incredibly daunting unless it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. God wants you to know that he will give you his grace for the place. That as we are surrendered to him, he will help you to love with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful sign. You know, in Luke 3, 21, it reads about the Lord Jesus. When all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized, the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. And as we allow the spirit of the living Christ, just as it filled Jesus himself when he was here on earth in all his humanity, when we allow that same spirit to live through us and to love through us, it can make a profound difference. You know, R.T. Kendall uh, has written a book on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And in it, he talks about a missionary couple who went to Jerusalem. And when they arrived there, uh, on the next day or two, on their window sill, there was a dove that made beautiful sounds. And they saw it as a symbolic gesture of the very presence of God. But when they would start to argue and fight with each other, the dove would fly away. When things were peaceful, the dove would come. And they finally had to make a decision. Either we adapt to the dove or he will leave. 
And if we go back to our own ways, we're not going to have the beautiful symbol of the presence of God. Now, if a dove would fly away when people were yelling and screaming at each other, how much more do we quench the Spirit of God when we don't follow in the things that he's nudging us to do? Friends, are you getting the picture today? A purpose became a symbol, a mentor, someone for the church to follow because he was following in the footsteps of the Lord, but he was guided by the Holy Spirit. And as you and I are guided by the very presence of Jesus as we learn to listen for his voice, I believe we can turn the world upside down for the glory of God because they will see the presence of the living Christ in us. Whether we're a baseball player, a hockey player, a sports announcer, or just someone like me, an ordinary Joe, maybe like you, uh, an ordinary Joe as well. God wants to live through you and love through you today. Well, we've had a week of talking to amazing sports people, athletes, announcers. We've also talked to Pastor Paul in Ukraine. We've been talking about the book of Colossians and the markers of the Christian faith. And Julie, I'm intrigued. What's been standing out in your mind today? Grow where you're planted. Be passionate about your gifts. Excel in your gifts. But don't worship your gifts. Remember who gave you the gifts. And as you think about gifts, I'm assuming you're referencing some of these incredibly gifted athletes that I could only pretend that I was like them. (laughs) Me too. But you know, in spite of that, I think the other word that stood out to me through this week is identity. What we get wrapped up in and who our identity is in. And Julie, what does it mean for you to have your identity in Jesus in just a nutshell? Unpack that for me. It means I don't have to be a perfectionist. It means I don't have to be fear failure. It means I can use failure to grow and I can have that peace and security of knowing that I'm always valued. I'm never damaged goods. Wow. Love to hear that. That was so well said. And as we wrap up today, why don't we pray together? Let's continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. Join with us as Julie leads us. Yes, Father, we want to lift up the people of Ukraine. And where they are right now, we pray that you will minister to them, that you will guide them, that you will help them to safety. We pray for peace. We pray for diplomacy in Jesus' name. And folks, remember to give to the people of Ukraine. Let's be a part together because together we can do more to bless them and encourage them. Thanks for watching Perspective. I think uh, just, I guess, trying to always make sure that you're getting better year after year and challenging yourself because you know that at the end of the road, you know, it's going to take a lot of hard work to make like a national team.